gentlemen, and welcome to the ET Now ICICI Prudential Value Investing Summit. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for taking time out and joining in for what is a very unique initiative in order to highlight the importance of value investing. And especially at a time when right now the stock markets are looking at a multi-year bull run. In fact, we have several interesting sessions that are lined up for you today. We also have a Q&A session where people in the audience will be able to ask questions to our esteemed panelists. So let's start off then by introducing and inviting ETNA's managing editor, Mr. R. Sridharan, to deliver his welcome speech. Shri. Thank you, Juan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the ET Now ICICI Value Investing Summit. Uh, as India's most watched business news channel, ET Now is committed to educating its viewers on the power of equity investing. Most small investors are scared of investing in equities because they fear they will end up losing money. And to be sure, many of them do. That's precisely why equity ownership among Indian households is tragically slow. According to recent RBI data, just 2% of financial savings of Indian households is in equity. It doesn't have to be so. Investing in stocks should be anything but a gamble. It cannot be a matter of chance. Investing ought to be about identifying the right stocks at the right price and with clear growth opportunities. Investing needs discipline and patience, and it doesn't matter if you're an experienced fund manager or a layman. Let me not take any more of your time. Sit back and enjoy. I have no doubts you're going to walk out of the room richer than what you did when you walked in first this morning. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Shri. Let me invite on stage Mr. Nimesh Shah, who's the Managing Director and CEO of ICICI Prudential to the stage. Under Nimesh's leadership, remember, ICICI Pru has experienced a remarkable turnaround in the fortunes and established itself as a leader in the mutual fund industry. So please go ahead. Thank you, Avan. Good morning, and once again, on behalf of ET Now and ICAC Prudential, thank you for joining us. So with that small opening remark, let me turn to Nimish. Nimish, the heart of value investing, I think, is a very simple concept. Buy low, sell high. Buy cheap. An Indian housewife knows this better than anyone else. Sasta hmm. leneka. But in real life, it is a very difficult activity to implement. It is difficult because uh, you are actually doing exactly opposite of what the rest of the world is doing. It's a lonely activity because when the rest of the world, the price is set by the growth investors, right? If they are selling some sector, if they are selling their stocks, they are selling it out and you will be buying at the price which the growth investor has already set. So price is set by the growth investor. He has already set the price. He's selling it. You're buying it and you're the lonely guy. So ability to tell people what has not worked in the past, that the time for value investing is when the past returns are not that good in that sector. That is the time to go and So that has been a challenge. So in value investing, past performance is no indication. That is why a mutual fund document says that past performance is no guarantee of future returns. Correct. And in fact, value investing, sometimes I feel when it has not worked, when uh, say that particular fund of, uh, when value funds don't perform that well, the last one year, two years, that's the time to invest because you are essentially looking at three to five years. If you have the waiting time for three years, five years, ideally five years, then only you should get into investing in value. Otherwise, don't invest in value. That's what our... Uh, that, that, that is the pitch. That is the pitch. Okay. So if I look at the global averages globally, and this is data which has been compiled by various agencies, which is 45% of the global investors are value investors globally. But India, that number is still in early teens. Why is that? Why is that India, we don't have true blue value investors? We have the oldest um, you know, exchange in the Asia, so equity is, is not a new culture for Indians. Uh, this is like uh, buying in a sale. Indians love buying in a sale, right? Every time there is a sale, we go and buy. So inherently, Indians love buying in a sale, but uh, when it comes to stock, people love to buy when it becomes expensive. So that's the challenge. That's the conviction that we'll require to go out and tell people. It's a, it's a question of experience. I think this concept in India is set to come. Only 5 to 6 percent of, say, even in mutual funds industry, out of the 3 lakh 10,000 crores, pure value funds would be around 15, 16,000 crores. So I feel that uh, over a period of time, uh, this concept is set to grow now. My next question to you is that typically value investing works when there is fear, when there is panic, when there is an event risk. 
Value investing may not work in a bull market. We are in a bull market. Why are you propagating value investing now? I am not propagating for two years. I think we are in the beginning of a. I think we are in a beginning of a bull market where 2015, according to us, is going to be a very interesting year. Uh, if uh, it's an investment year, if you see the last 10 years, except years like 2007, value investing does not work in a bubble market, right? But that is that it won't work. But that is the time to invest also in a value fund. 2007 could have been a good time to invest when the past performance, I started off that you should invest in a value fund when a past performance is not there. So this time when there is a bubble in the market, that time I would expect that your audience which is watching it today will look, be looking at value funds because they are relatively cheaper at that time. Value is not essentially buying cheap, right? Value is buying at a discount to the intrinsic value. Okay. So today it is our ability, my fund manager's ability to understand value with the next three years, the way the industry is going to span out, which are the sectors in the industry where he believes, where the fund manager believes that there will be uh, sufficient amount of growth. So another aspect, people believe, if people believe that value and growth are completely two uh, different concepts and one does not work with that, they always work together. Uh, they are like, uh, as Warren Buffett suggested, they are joint, there is a joint at the hip, yes. right? It has to work together. Value with some, is always with the growth that is envisaged over next three years. That is where value will work today. My final question to you is that the virtue of value investing is also patient investing. You have to wait it out. You could be lonely. But in today's day and age, when NAVs of mutual fund schemes are tracked not on a monthly basis, but on a daily basis, and you judged on your performance, and that's how flows move, uh, is it, is it uh, advisable to follow the path of value investing? 10 years history, credibility of the AMC, and the ability to take a contra call on a consistent basis we have delivered. Uh, so though NAVs have to be declared daily, a uh, lot of mutual fund holdings from one and a half years now is beyond three years. The average holding for our investor is now beyond three years. I think this year would be the takeoff year for value investing really to time. We are kicking off with this particular initiative where we want to go into the market and explain people that there is a whole area which uh, Indians need to focus more. Let's now focus on the keynote address that I'm sure you all have been waiting for. I know I have with bated breath. Mr. Monish Pabrai needs very little introduction to fans of value investing. His Pabrai Investment Funds, which started in the year 1999, inspired by Warren Buffett's original 1950s firm, Buffett Partnerships, has delivered annualized returns of more than 17% for 15 years now. And that's net to the fund's investors. Mr. Pabrai is in fact also the author of a book on value investing going by the name Dhando Investors and I'm sure most of you have read it. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mr. Munish Pabrai, Managing Partner of Pabrai Investment Funds. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, so many of you have heard, uh, you've heard the story of the man who invented the game of chess. And um, when he invented the game, the, the king of that, of that region became a huge fan. And uh, he became an addict and an ardent chess player. And uh, he asked the inventor of the game to ask for any reward. And the inventor said, you know, I don't want much. I just want you to, on the chessboard, put uh, one grain of rice on the first square and then uh, two grains on the second square, and then four grains on the third square, and then keep doubling the grains uh, as you go on on every square. And uh, when, when you fill up the chessboard up to the 64th square, that is all I'm looking for. And, um, and the king was kind of annoyed because he said, you know, I wanted to give you all these all this, uh, great rewards, and all you want is a bunch of rice. And he said, yeah, that's all I want. So he tells his treasurer, you know, measure out the rice for this guy and get him out of my court. And um, after a week when the treasurer wasn't done yet, so the king asked, you know, uh, what's, uh, 
what's the problem? And, uh, and the treasurer said that, uh, you know, we don't, uh, we don't have the rice. And he said that uh, not only do we not have the rice, we don't, uh, we don't actually uh, have that amount of rice on the planet. Um, and so we just cannot, uh, we cannot fulfill uh, the obligation. And, um, you know, I, I went back and actually uh, calculated um, how, much that, how much rice that might be. And it ends up that at uh, present rice prices, it would be about uh, $300 trillion. And uh, $300 trillion is an interesting number because it is exactly just about the, the wealth of every man, woman, and child on the planet. So if you looked at U.S. household wealth, it is about uh, approximately $80 trillion. And I think global wealth is just around $300 trillion. And um, so that is... Uh, that is the power of compounding, and, uh, and that is why Einstein uh, called it the eighth wonder of the world. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm an engineer by training, and uh, I hadn't gone to business school, and um, I heard about Buffett, uh, Warren Buffett for the first time in 1994, um, just about 20 years ago. And, um, and when I heard about him and I read uh, the first couple of biographies that had been written on him, I was actually stunned because, uh, because uh, what Buffett had done is uh, quite astounding. So at that time, I really had no, no knowledge of the world of investments. And uh, when I looked at Buffett's track record, uh, and at that time I could see a 44-year track record from 1950 to 1993, and over that 44-year period, he had compounded at 31% uh, annualized. And 31% uh, annualized means that you're basically moving to the next square on the chessboard in less than three years, uh, like 2.6 years or something. And, um, and then when I calculated you know, the 44-year period, he, had, he was already at that time on the 18th square. And uh, he didn't look like he was going to slow down or stop. And I said, my God, you know, this guy is uh, uh, the wealthiest human on the planet and likely to continue to stay there um, for a while. And that's exactly what's happened. So from 1994 to 2014, we've gone another 20 years. And uh, even though the sums have become larger and his compounding rate is, is lower in the last 20 than the previous 20, uh, it's still not of north of 20% a year. And so uh, Warren Buffett, even after having given away so many billion, is uh, north of uh, 70 billion net worth. And so that is, uh, uh, that is the power of compounding. And, uh, and, and that's why I think that uh, this chessboard story and Einstein comments are so, so wonderful to keep in mind. In, in 94, uh, I made a couple of observations, and I, I wasn't familiar with the hedge fund industry at the time. I was familiar with the mutual fund industry, and I couldn't find uh, any mutual funds that had that sort of a track record um, then or even, even today. Warren Buffett's approach, uh, which is so different, is he said that you're not buying a stock, uh, you're buying a business. The stock market is there to serve you, not to instruct you. So uh, never look at stock prices to tell you what's going on with the business, uh, but really look at stock prices uh, to serve you in the sense that if they are uh, creating wide distortions between intrinsic value and the price of stock, you can certainly look at that as buying a buying opportunity. And if uh, that's not there, then uh, the intrinsic value is approximating the market price and you own a stock, it's probably a good time to, to move on. And I had a notion that uh, Buffett's approach was replicatable, and I didn't find very, very many people trying to replicate it. And uh, so I decided to give it a try. I think the important thing is that you keep moving to the next square, because as you keep moving to the next square, the magic of compounding, the eighth wonder of the world, starts working for you. And um, so, I was 30 years old at, at the time in 94, and I had an IT business. I actually sold some assets in the business, and after taxes and such, I was left with about a million dollars. 
uh, that I didn't really need. Uh, it was just an extra million in the bank. And in fact, it was my first million in the bank because we had started the company on credit cards. And so I thought, uh, what if we put this million on the, the Buffett compounding engine, if you will, and I had a notion that if someone followed uh, Buffett's approach to investing, and uh, which, may, which means you make few bets, uh, you make big bets, and they're infrequent bets, you think of stocks as a business, you buy them and they're on sale, uh, you patiently wait for that, that value gap between market price and intrinsic value to close, and then you sell and move on to your next investment. So a million, you know, if you go 30 years, that's 10 three-year periods. And 10 three-year periods uh, is 2 to the power of 10. And 2 to the power of 10 is 1,024. And we don't care so much about the 24. We can forget about that. So 2 to the power of 10 becomes 1,000, which means that if you start um, with a crore, you're going to have 1,000 crores. And if you start with a million, uh, you'd end up with a billion. And, uh, and I thought that would seem like a very easy way uh, to become a billionaire. And I said, I also thought that, you know, if I fell short, even fell short by 80%, that still wouldn't be such a bad result. Uh, 200 million was fine with me as well. It's, uh, it's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful journey for, uh, uh, I think it's been about 19 years now, and uh, I hope it doesn't end in 11 years. I hope it continues. <laughs>
I know you're a big fan of this checklist approach. So what does your checklist really contain? And how do you identify a good value business? Yeah, the checklist doesn't help identify ideas. It just helps, uh, uh, I would say, um, wet them and, and help them. But uh, I have no original ideas. Uh, I think almost everything in our portfolio is cloned from some other uh, investor I admire. And uh, the wonderful part of the, of the business is I still get paid, you know, even though I have no ideas. And um, so, uh, you know, I think, I, think in, and I think in India you have the same requirements. In the U.S., uh, we have these 13F requirements, uh, filing requirements, which professional investors have to file uh, once, they, uh, once they cross, I think, over $100 million under management. And I think in India, uh, there's, uh, there's a requirement once you go over 1%, I think the, the brokers have to disclose it. And uh, so I think those are, if you can identify great investors in India and look at their portfolios and look at the, uh, especially the ideas where they, the, they have the greatest conviction, uh, then those, uh, those portfolios will, will tend to do well. So typically when you identify a stock idea, you have an entry point in mind. But yeah. what about your average holding period? What about your exit? Uh, do you plan something when you're actually investing in a stock in an idea? Yeah, typically what I do is when I, before I make the investment, uh, I'll run the checklist and of course do all the, all the analysis. But in the end, I write up uh, typically a paragraph. It's usually no more than uh, five or six sentences, which explains uh, the thesis, you know, which is, explains why I'm investing, uh, what I think the intrinsic value of the business might be, and at what point we might sell, and what are we looking for. Most times, I have a good idea of what intrinsic value is, and usually I'll go back every three months or six months and update uh, that paragraph. So uh, if, you, if you buy something that will within your circle of competence, uh, by definition, you know what it's worth. Because if you don't know what it's worth, it's, within, it's not in your circle of competence. And uh, you know, if you know third grade math, uh, you know what it's worth, you divide by two. And uh, if it's priced below that, so I typically am not interested in buying assets uh, that are not priced at least half of what I think they're worth. And, uh, and then uh, we use our third grade math, uh, divide by two, and if it's less than that, we'll, we'll buy it. And then uh, as it approaches full price, typically anything at 90% or more of intrinsic value, it's a candidate for sale. Okay, we will open to the floor and Avan is going to take up the questions. For anyone who has specific questions for Monish, uh, the mic is just going to reach you. The mic is with the gentleman. The Hi floor. Monish, thanks for being here and sharing your insights. Uh, I'm a student at Stanford and I was curious to get your insights on the global economy moving forward. So in particular in light of the fact that the ruble's down 40%, Russia is expected to contract 5% next year. So what is 2015 going to be like for investors? Do you expect it to be a really choppy ride with the sanctions on Russia, Ukraine crisis, Iran sanctions, or is there a glimmer of hope or some positive outlook for 2015? Whatever we have going on today, um, you can pick any time in history, and the world always has issues. I mean, it's just the nature of humanity. We've got all these things going on that you always have issues. So uh, the best thing to do when you're investing is to focus on the micro, to focus on a specific business. And it is hard enough to just uh, hone in on a particular business and try to extra extrapolate forward what happens to that business. Uh, so I, I, I generally think it is uh, going to hurt investors more than it's going to help investors if you overdose on macro. Uh, I would say that most, most of those things are very hard to predict. And the best thing is to just not bother with predicting them. I would say this, I would say that, and I don't, uh, hopefully it doesn't taint too much of my investing, but I have a view that the United States, I believe, is the emerging market. I think the, what I see is the country has so many strengths uh, and is in such tremendous shape for a number of reasons that I actually think that next, next decade or two, it'll do incredibly well. I also think that there's a chance in India, you know, there's a lot of uh, expectations of Mr. Modi, and Modi ji uh, has to be super Modi ji <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, to fulfill those. But I, but I think that some of those uh, expectations are well-founded. Uh, I think I'm 
I would say I would be bullish on India because um, for the first time, uh, I think in our history as a country, uh, we have a capitalist, uh, an honest capitalist who's running the place. Indian government needs to do two or three things, get, get out of the way, focus on infrastructure, focus on education, and, and then let the, let the people do their thing. And uh, there's a good chance that in the next 10 or 15 years, uh, we, will, we will look back in a decade or two and seen remarkable change in India. And if that change is in the direction that we expect it to be, I think everyone would be surprised uh, with how conservative they were about the outlook for India. Thanks for that. And Manish, you make it sound so easy. Armchair investing, third grade math, no using <laughs> Excel. But uh, on a serious note, it was certainly very thought-provoking and very insightful, as I'm sure everyone in the audience will agree.